I was brought up in a family where there were no scientists in the countryside and ended up going to London to do a science degree. And I went to do biophysics at King's College with um, Maurice Wilkins, who was involved in the DNA discovery. And it slowly got sort of drawn into the in an interest in science and uh, became particularly interested in microscopy and uh, the use of uh, x-rays to, to solve structures. But uh, at that point, I'd got no idea that I'd end up in science. It was a, a sort of fantasy, you know, given my background. Um, but somehow I managed to, to get a place doing a PhD. It was still relatively early days for solving protein structures. So I went to uh, Bristol to work on protein structure. And Morris Wilkins said, why do you want to do that? They've solved the structure of a protein because this was just shortly after the first protein structures had come out. And it, it's sort of remarkable how people can sort of be wrong about things because the amazing thing about biology is the immense diversity of it. So even now with you know, thousands of structures of proteins, we're still uh, struggling to understand how the individual proteins work and how they fit together to make the machines of life. I wanted to go and work abroad um, and uh, ended up going to work in China for a year and a half in the early 1980s um, and that was a fascinating sort of experience um, as China was at that point opening up and it, it, the, there was an opportunity, although I was still learning my career, of, of bringing in some ideas that, 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 that were helpful to people. After that I, I, I sort of came back and uh, uh, moved to Oxford and uh, I've stayed in the Oxford area for a long time since, since then. I was in structural biology at the time when its power was increasing and it, be, it was possible by pushing a little bit on the technical side to work on things that uh, you know a few years earlier would have, people would have thought impossible and, and to look at uh, structures of, of, of complexity and I started working on virus structure and uh, I, I, that's something that uh, has been a fantastic sort of uh, thing to be able to do for, for a number of years now. I think it was in the uh, late 1970s and at that point there wasn't a, uh, a synchrotron that you could go and do such experiments uh, at in the UK. Um, however, there was some pioneering work being done at a, uh, a synchrotron near Paris, and that was called Lure. Uh, and one or two people uh, from Oxford uh, would occasionally go over there and, and try, try some experiments. So I was involved really as a sort of bystander in going along on, on one of those experiments um, to work on, on, on crystals of, of proteins. It was completely different. Uh, at that point, the, the, the first experiments, things, everything was aligned by hand. Uh, there weren't concrete hutches. There was a wooden uh, hutch, uh, which was lead-lined. And the person that uh, constructed the experiment, if he wanted to align the experiment, he would lock himself in the uh, wooden hutch and do the alignment with the beam on. What you could do was, was much more limited. It was a few people could see that this that there, the possibility here. Um, but it was only marginally better than using a, a conventional source that people already had in their laboratories. Um, so, so it was a, uh, many people in the field were sceptical of, of the value of this. But uh, it, was, uh, it was great fun to be, to, to be there at the, in some of those early experiments. I've always been interested in evolution and in biology. Um, it, it seems to me that the thing that defines biology, the fact that uh, you get, uh, you have uh, replicating organisms that uh, have a genetic history um, and can mutate and, and evolve. And although they are complicated in many ways, they're, they're enormously simple compared to every other form of life. So one of the great things from my point of view is that it, it lacks, allows you to sort of peer in and, and see the sort of workings of biology at the most sort of simple level and how evolution produces new functions and uh, new viruses and, and stuff like that. So that's one of the things that um, 
that fascinates me. Um, and, and the fact that viruses are, are very much <coughs> sort of simple physical entities. So the evolution of the virus um, acts at the genetic level, but um, the selection acts at the phenotype. And with a virus, the, the phenotype is very, very simple. It's the structure of the virus. So I, I just like this, this idea that you can uh, look at the structure of, uh, of the virus capsid and you can see back into the evolutionary history. We've been lucky to have a, a wonderful collaboration over many years with a, with a group in Finland, Dennis Bamford. And together, uh, we, we sort of put forward the idea that you could rationally classify viruses according to the structure of the capsid. And that's uh, based on the idea that it's so difficult for biology to invent a virus capsid. It has to be something that self-assembles, can get into the cell, it protects the genome. That once that is stumbled up, uh, upon by evolution, it's maintained very strongly through evolution. The traditional way of classifying viruses was according to what host they infect, what their genome type is, and things like that. But in fact, what, what we found is that if you look at the structure of the capsid, you can see that there are deep relationships between viruses that on that basis would be thought of as, as very different. And uh, we, we found that you can actually identify a small number of structure-based lineages that cut across the domains of life. So they're found in, in animals, they're found in plants, they're found in, in bacteria. Um, and that gives a, 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 a sort of, for me, a sort of satisfying um, uh, way of thinking about viruses. Otherwise, it, it's chaos. And, and the reason, of course, is that, that, that viruses mutate very quickly. So the genome changes very quickly. So it becomes impossible to see any evolutionary relationship between viruses after a fairly short evolutionary distance. For years, we were sort of up against it. People ridiculed the idea. But uh, I, I noticed in uh, a year or so ago, the uh, Taxonomy of Virus uh, uh, Committee uh, reintroduced a new sort of order within the uh, classification of viruses, uh, which recognised this. And, and what was what's particularly nice from my point of view is that the uh, one of those uh, structure related classifications, which is like the sort of a kingdom within the virus uh, world, uh, was named after Dennis Bamford. So <laughs> that, that was. I thought, well, <laughs> that, that, that's really, really nice um, that that's been recognised because uh, Dennis, Dennis really was the person that uh, championed this. But then the dark side is that uh, uh, they're, they're just such a sort of unpredictable threat to, to, to human health. And uh, it must have just been fairly shortly before the pandemic. I remember giving a talk in Denmark, I think it was. In the introduction, I was... You know, there was this question, why a virus is important? Well, I said, you know, there, there could be another pandemic. You know, we, there, there's a real risk of, of, of something serious happening. Um, and uh, the person that gave the talk after me said, oh, well, David's talked about viruses, but of course the real problem with human health is cancer or whatever it was. You know? And that's true, but I thought, well, yes, it's easy to say that. And then, uh, and then I felt sort of uh, awful when uh, the pandemic started, you know, relatively soon, soon after that and uh, um, has unravelled in this very complicated way. Yeah, I, I, I was involved in photomath disease virus work from the beginning of my independent career, really. When I was starting off uh, trying to find my own research direction, uh, in, uh, I was in, in Oxford, and I talked to the head of the lab, who was uh, David Phillips, who did the first uh, enzyme structure, a uh, well-known person in structural biology. Um, and he had been talking to uh, a very a wonderful virologist called Fred Brown, who worked at Purbright, which is an hour and a half drive for, from Oxford. But he was really keen to try and uh, develop vaccines against foot and mouth. He was, you know, probably the world expert on foot and mouth disease virus. But uh, perhaps unusually for a virologist, he saw that structure should be informative um, in thinking about how you design a vaccine against against the virus. So David Phillips uh, drove us down, we went in, 
into the contained labs, um, put our sort of white suits on and uh, went around and, and talked to Fred. And Fred was extremely keen to, to make, make this happen. And David Phillips was fantastically generous. He just sort of said, well, you know, you take this as your project, um, and which I did. And, and, and we started uh, working with Fred and, and the people around him. And, um, and in fact, one of the people that I work most closely with, Dave Rowlands, I, I still collaborate with. He's uh, working up in, in Leeds and working on poliovirus vaccines together. Um, so it, it was a, a, a wonderful collaboration to, to start my career on but um, it wasn't easy because the foot and mouth disease is one of the most infectious viruses there is and it's a category four uh, uh, pathogen uh, so there's very strict uh, control over it um, at that point the only way that we could collect useful structural biology data was to go to a synchrotron and we were lucky that uh, the Darsborough synchrotron had come online uh, not very long ahead of that. So this was the uh, sort of mid-1980s. So Fred uh, worked very hard with the regulatory authorities to work out procedures that would allow us to take uh, foot and mouth disease virus crystals to the synchrotron uh, to do the experiments. There was lots of layers of control to make sure it was safe, but we uh, ended up uh, effectively solving the structure of, of the live virus. We, we had no idea uh, really how to go about growing the crystals of the virus because nobody in the UK was working on virus structures at that time. And the person that solved the first uh, animal virus uh, in the world uh, was, was just, at this point, had just solved the structure of the common cold virus, and that was Michael Rossman in Purdue University. So I, I contacted him and he sent me a matchbox with uh, glass tubes with mounted virus crystals in so that we could use those at the synchrotron to make sure that we optimise the data collection setup. Uh, and that was fantastic because we could immediately see what a, a good crystal could do at a synchrotron, which was breathtaking, sort of masses of, 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 of diffraction spots. And uh, we knew then what we were aiming for and, and we went through a number of uh, different crystal forms and, and then, you know, one day we sort of saw this <laughs> Fantastic diffraction, uh, and from then it was it, it was there was a, a lot to do, but it, it was sort of uh, we knew it was doable, and eventually uh, you know our, our group uh, managed to solve the structure um, in a collaboration with uh, uh, Fred and, and Dave and, and the team. The disappointing thing was that the major antigenic site, the place where most of the antibodies you need to generate to neutralize the virus to get a good vaccine response. The, the disappointing thing was that the bit that was critical was flexible. It was interesting and there was a good biological reason for that because it's a part of the mechanism that the virus attaches to the cells, but we didn't know that at the time. Um, so there was a little bit of frustration there because the, the bit that uh, you, you might want to engineer to make uh, to improve the vaccines was was blurred out um, and at that time um, it was also a time when there wasn't a lot of funding for vaccine research there was a, a real gap and it was it was only um, you know after after the uh, millennium and when there was the the, the 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 outbreak that we were able to to re-establish a, a proper collaboration with virologists uh, again at Purbright, but this time with the uh, the animal um, the, the government lab there, the Institute for Animal Health, as it was. But we still got that collaboration going now, and uh, we're quite well advanced to 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 actually sort of engineering a, a safer, a completely safe version of, of a vaccine for, for foot and mouth, where we've managed to use structure to help stabilize the protein shell of the virus, then we can remove, we can make sure there's no genetic information in so it's non-infectious and safe uh, and make that, that can then be made in, in large quantities um, and, and produces a vaccine. So it's hard to say, but I, I would, if, if things go well in about three years, we might see um, the vaccine come into market, which, which would be a fantastic thing to see, but something could still go wrong. It 
it, it, it's so much about the, the the people, the collaborations, and uh, and the people within you know the group that, that you work with. So we've managed to to keep a working collaboration uh, with Dave Rowlands. Uh, uh, actually, that carried on in one form or another all the way through because. Uh, when Dave switched and started working on human vaccines, and we did some collaboration on uh, work on hepatitis B, um, so that was fun. In the last few years, we've been able to work as partnership, uh, a partnership with led by Dave on, uh, which has been supported by WHO in particular, trying to develop the uh, a new generation of polio vaccines now. You might say, why do we need a polio vaccine? Because the polio vaccines are very good and they're, they're fantastic vaccines. But um, there's two sorts of polio vaccines at the moment. There's the oral uh, polio vaccine, which is, uh, a ver which is a live virus, but it's an attenuated version of the virus. And then there's an activated uh, polio vaccine, which is made by growing up virulent virus and then killing it. So neither of those are ideal. Um, and... The bigger problem is that um, although there were, although we've come close to eliminate, eliminating the disease from the world, there is still virus circulating in the world. Uh, there are some people who've uh, who've been given the, the live virus, and the virus has, has then sort of reverted within them, and they become uh, persistently infected and can shed the virus. So there's uh, there's a risk of of manufacturing live virus. Um, there's uh, the risk of uh, people in the community um, shedding the virus. There's a, a big drive from the WHO to find a solution that doesn't involve the production of, of live virus. Because once you sort of get rid of the disease, once you um, do that, you need to keep vaccinating people for quite a long time. Otherwise, if you stop vaccinating, you'll get a, a recurrence of the disease. So, so that's uh, so we've been uh, using sim similar sort of methods to, to those that we've used in the foot and mouth disease virus with poliovirus because they're, they're related viruses. It's a, a lot of the ideas carry across. It's been completely transformative. When I started my career, it was already just about possible to solve a protein structure, but it was a, a mammoth effort. Um, every, every stage in, in the process was, was very difficult. So for, you know, a few things that, w that were of really sort of high value or interest, you, you know, you can imagine doing it. Um, but what synchrons have done is to transform that so that essentially the sort of cost of goods of doing a, a structure of a protein is, is now... Uh, tiny and the speed of the whole process it's not just been synchrotrons it's been there have been other aspects that have enabled that there have been revolutions in molecular biology that have allowed the production of any protein in large amounts to, to be achieved relatively quickly and routinely there are in investments in so-called structural genomics um, which started about 20 years ago which really I, I tried to look at the whole pipeline of going from yes, this is a protein of interest or a target that we're interested in, to this is what the structure is. What's remarkable is that the synchrotron end of that uh, has just carried on in, in developing in substantial ways. Or, as, you know, it hasn't stopped. So the result now is that uh, where, where when I was doing my PhD, it took me the PhD to determine a single protein structure uh, on a beamline at diamond, uh, if you're trying to find a, a drug, a compound that binds to a, a protein crystal, you can look at 500 or, or, or more structures in a sing single day. So it means that it becomes feasible and timely to link the structure determination in with the process of drug discovery um, and uh, in, in with the process of understanding biology much more intimately. So um, it becomes, you know, a, an essential tool of uh, understanding the, the biological structure at a fundamental level. Uh, but it also is now central to the drug discovery programs of all of the major pharmaceutical uh, companies.
it's it's interesting, and we're sort of in the middle of uh, of these developments, so we don't know uh, where it's going to end. But I but I would hope that over the next few years, just the scale of the knowledge that comes out of the the work at synchrotrons will allow fundamental improvements in the way drugs are designed, and that you could uh, you know people might say that's science fiction, but if you if you look at uh, what's happened in understanding how proteins fold, um, there's, I don't know, 50 years of people trying to sort of work out how proteins fold from first principles, and they still fail to solve that problem. But then, alongside that, synchrotron started to produce very large numbers of examples of protein structures, real protein structures. They were put into, a, into one of the first uh, databases, public databases, the Protein Data Bank. And now that protein data bank has many tens of thousands um, of, of uh, high quality structures. And by applying the techniques of machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence uh, to that, um, the uh, DeepMind uh, AlphaFold group came up with this, uh, came up with an algorithm that allowed for the first time a, a reasonably good prediction of many protein structures. So problems that have, be, have, have really sort of been too difficult for people to solve from first principles, when you have that mass of data, you can sometimes uh, have a transformative effect. And I don't see any reason why that shouldn't apply to drug discovery. So if you look at the, uh, the uh, program at Diamond, XChem, which d produces many thousands of, of structures. I think there's over 20,000 structures done for SARS uh, COV2 targets uh, during the pandemic. That's a very rich source of information. And I don't see why it shouldn't be possible to use that to better, uh, to go from those initial observations, which are very simple compounds interacting with the protein, not drugs, but to then assemble that information and use computational tools to more rapidly elaborate those into molecules that resemble drugs and may, you know, accelerate the process of, of, of getting there. And beyond that, you, you, you should be able to link that in uh, with uh, robotic chemical synthesis. You should be able to sort of um, use your knowledge of retrosynthetic uh, pathways for chemistry to to uh, actually sort of much more effectively uh, progress down the route from a, a simple sort of insignificantly binding uh, s small chemical fragment to something that uh, could be effective as a, as a drug.